I think we are recording. Welcome everybody to another exciting town hall, town hall 81. And uh, welcome from the sunny shores of Emerald Hills in the Silicon Valley Bay Area. It's not quite like you see behind me, but uh, it is in spirit. So I've got my, my special sunny shirt on again. I'd like to welcome everybody. Thank you for joining town hall number 81. We have with us again uh, another episode from our site glide partners who are doing amazing things, building incredible an incredible digital experience platform on top of platform OS. So today we're going to have Martin take us through the journey so far and how picking the right core platform has been instrumental in them being able to build SiteGlide and how that the core modular architecture of SiteGlide allows for all this flexibility and scalability beyond what you would normally get in a traditional SaaS product uh, where you're kind of restricted in the admin areas and restricted in certain workflows no restrictions and you'll see an example of that and also how SiteGlide are able to build more than just another better quote unquote Adobe business catalyst. This is far more re out, uh, reaching than just a, a better BC. It's not just another mousetrap as they say. Uh, we are very, very proud to have SiteGlide as our partners and without further ado, over to Martin and of course we have the principal of SiteGlide with us as well. Luke Wakefield, but I think Martin, you're taking taking the reins. Over to you, mate. Excellent, thanks, Adam. And uh, yeah, evening, morning, afternoon, everybody. Oh, I should probably click that button there. Uh, so, yeah, what we'll do today is um, take a look at some of the ecosystem and the relationship between platform OS and SiteLite. Um, we've been through some of this before, so I won't. I, I could do a 40-minute presentation on, on just this alone, but I, I won't go into too much detail. I'll pick a couple of points, and I'm going to show some examples of that, um, which we'll see afterwards. Um, particularly focusing on database today with the new events module and uh, performance improvements and that kind of thing. And then we'll come on to recent releases. So releases uh, or features we've released in the last two weeks. So in between our last um, public webinar with our partners and now, uh, including some performance updates and some nice e-commerce ones as well. And then we'll take a sneak peek at some of the upcoming features. So some of the things that the development team are gonna be working on next and bringing, uh, bringing to the platform in the next week or two. So, um, right, let's click here. So we'll start off looking at the ecosystem. This is a graphic that I'm sure most people watching will be familiar with, um, but it's worth sort of recapping just to understand the relationship here. So at the bottom there that everything is built on is uh, the core services like AWS. Um, and I know Platform OS are working hard to expand that to Google and Azure as well uh, in time. And Platform West are building their architecture for the platform um, with various um, technologies with their flexible API, multi-cloud support, GraphQL, Liquid, YAML, Node.js, and all of those great things. Uh, and they're also making use of the Direct West 3 uploads for the assets and so on. So you'll have seen uh, on previous town halls the announcements about storage updates for files and media and that kind of thing. Uh, so that's all stuff that we can use in our platform having built on top. So if I go through to the next one. So just touching on uh, Platform OS on the DevOps layer in a little bit more detail, and then we'll turn to, to how SiteGlide builds on top. Um, so Platform OS have obviously five uh, key drivers um, that they've had from the outset, but have made more clear recently. Um, and it's one of the main reasons that we picked them. Um, so security, performance, scalability, flexibility, and reliability. Um, now, uh, I can easily do a whole, whole thing on them, but we're going to focus on some of them and we'll see uh, particularly scalability, performance, and flexibility coming into it. Uh, but of course, reliability and security kind of run behind the scenes in everything that we're doing here. So thanks to AWS and industry leaders there and the great work that Platform West have done in terms of building the architecture, they have 99.9% .9 uptime with multi-cloud support. Now, that's not just for sort of admin in the core Platform OS, that is for domains as well. So Platform West recently announced 
that uh, they agreed relationships with Google Cloud team and Azure as well. Uh, so when you're putting a site live or building a site, that will soon become an option in our platform as well, rather than only having to go with AWS. And that will be great for some of your larger clients, perhaps, you have a specific uh, requirement there. And of course, they all of the other great things, so 100% uh, Google Lighthouse speed, um, so blazing fast, and our sites are running off that as well. Um, along with the CDN and the load balances with auto scaling, etc. So you get all of these benefits while building with SiteLive 2, because as we saw, I wonder if I can go back. Yes, I can, look at that. So as you saw on this graphic, the top layer there is SiteLive. So we're building on top of Platform OS and we're making use of these technologies without you having to have an entire dev team who, who specialize in writing the GraphQL, the Liquid, the YAML, uh, and so on. So we're making access to those easier and able um, and make uh, sorry and make it possible for projects to be able to scale to enterprise level um, without needing the huge dev team and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars that come with that. So as an example, some of the features that we've built on top uh, include uh, the CMS, the CRM with the modules and web apps, um, SEO features, e-commerce, and our brand new events module that I'm going to touch on in a bit. Um, so we give you access to the core database structure through a point and click UI, as I mentioned just before. Now, in addition to all of that, you, if you have a development team or you're technically minded yourself, you can still get under the core and get the best of both worlds and work directly with Platform OS on some of the areas of your site. So we've probably seen it more prevalently with um, some bespoke, bespoke searching and filtering of database objects um, and linking with React apps and things like that as well, where the, those development teams have set them up with the core platform OS, but they've linked it in such a way because it's built within SiteLive that the client can still easily manage that data. Um, and as we can see in the graphic here, so there's a few, a few other bits that we've added on on top. So we're building on top of platform OS, and then we're also connecting out from our API, which is the core central point, to things like GitHub for code versioning, uh, which we'll see more of in our UI later, um, along with the CLI and developer tools, and they begin to integrate that way. So let me keep going through. Okay, so I'm going to take a look at one, one example. So two weeks ago, we released the events module on our platform. Now, I'm not going to go through the whole presentation that we did last time, but I am going to take a quick look and explain some of the mechanics and how we're utilizing the core architecture of Platform OS to deliver the events module. So our team have added uh, calendar integrations, maps integrations, and ticketing on top but it will all run on the core structure. So if I, I'm just going to back out of the presentation here and move zoom. There we go. So um, let's start in the site. So I've got a starter site installed on my, one of my test sites. So if I come back to the home page, this will look familiar to site live partners. Um, so this is all front end and connecting to the admin. And what I've done is gone to site settings, which is over here, and installed the new events module that you can find in the list of modules here. So if I come back to admin. Now, one of the things I'm going to point out here is on the architecture, as I said it would. Now, in, with BC as a platform, as an example, um, web apps were built very differently to modules. So modules tended to be much more changed and they behaved differently, they had different limitations and so on. Uh, now that's one of the problems um, that we haven't had to overcome thanks to the way we, our dev team, have been able to build and utilize the platform West core architecture. So if I come into one of these web apps and just edit it for a second, uh, edit module structure. Okay, so we can see, as you would expect, it looks very familiar to the BC layouts. So you've got all of your custom fields there and along with some standard fields. Oh, sorry, I'm in modules. 
I've done it backwards, but it's fine, it doesn't matter. So when I come over to a web app, you'll see that it looks exactly the same as modules. <laughs> Um, now, that's because we've built modules and web apps along with e-commerce, CRM, forms, uh, and things like that, all on the same architecture. So it makes it consistent and scalable because they're all built in the same way and they're all built on uh, that core uh, MySQL database. So if I come and quickly look at forms as well before I move um, on. I just want to just correct you, sorry, Postgres. Ah, Postgres Enterprise. Yeah, that's, uh, I, I just wanted to clear any any thoughts around using something that's not quite enterprise. But uh, Postgres, okay. Postgres for those who care. All right, go on. Continue. Awesome. Sorry. No, no, it's good. So um, in forms here, we have fields as well, and you can see just from a UI perspective that they all look very similar. Now that's because we based them all off of that core um, Postgres architecture. Um, so the, the Platform OS DevOps team are managing all of the back end part there for performance and speed, reliability, et cetera, so that we don't have to, and we can focus on making the features accessible to you. So if I take a look at our events module, I'm just gonna show you a quick sort of whistle stop tour of some of the features there um before moving on so uh not e-commerce there we go so i have my new events module in here and much like web apps i can come in and create new items or i can go into an existing web app item and i've got all of the normal fields that you would have in bc uh with start and end date along with um a space for ticketing so this is gonna i'm gonna come on to this in a moment because it links with e-commerce which is the same architecture as web apps um, but first, what I'm going to do is just load up the events page. So when you install the events module, you get all of these layouts uh, with it automatically. And you can choose to either keep these or you can edit them to be more bespoke or you could scrap the whole lot and you could use your own structure. So as long as you keep the folder structure the same, you can enter whatever you'd like in here. Now, uh, so if I click, um, into an event. So this is our last executive lounge with our community. We can see that I go into a detail page. Now, this is calling out data from those web apps and modules um, exactly the same way as you would expect on across other areas of your site, such as gallery or, or uh, services, things like that. Now, I've edited a couple of these to include host. And I've also, I think it's on the first one, there we go. Integrated it with e-commerce for tickets. So what I will do is quickly go here. So we can see I've got a tickets field and I've selected a product that we've created in e-commerce. And I have made a specific product for this ticket, but you will see all products when you, uh, when you click in here. Now this allows you for maximum flexibility because it means that you could sell a ticket on a landing page or with an offer or a discount code um, or what have you. You could even have uh, ship tickets manually on a piece of paper if you wanted to and, and manage it that way. So I'm going to head over to e-commerce to take a look at this ticket. There we go. So if I go into products and you can see I've already pre-searched for this, for this ticket, but if I head in here, I have um, a whole range of fields that look very familiar because it's built the same. Um, now I've selected an image, I've got a product code, and if I come over to pricing, you can see that I've got a price of $1 or one pound, depending on where we, are, where we are in the world. Now, if I was to set this price to zero, so say I wanted to give tickets to a, a virtual event and I didn't really mind how many people turned up. Zero. There we go. And I refresh, you can see the price. And I click to the e-commerce product. Just move zoom out of the way. There we go. We can see now see that it says it's sold out. So it'll automatically detect that. Now that's a toggle in e-commerce, um, depending on your marketing style and how you'd like to present the information. Some people might prefer to just remove the product entirely if it's sold out. 
Um, so we've automatically effectively data sourced the information. So we've gone and got this product and pulled it into the event um, and allowed somebody to purchase a ticket. Now, unique identifiers for the tickets will be running off of the form IDs because that's unique every time. Um, and then as we can see, I've, uh, if I go back, I'll just remove this. So I'll set the price back up again. Okay. okay, so I'm going to go to inventory control instead. Now, I've got a quantity of zero at the moment, so I'll set it to 100. There we go. So now I'm able to select a ticket. And if I was to set it to 100 and cheat, rather than somebody filling out and buying all of those tickets, we can see that it would automatically then update and block purchases just the same as if you'd set the price um, price down to zero there. So I'm going to come back out. Now, one of the things we looked at in our last presentation with our, with our community was um, what if you've got one online? And I've touched on this slightly. So I, if I come back out here, you can see that on my event layouts, I set, set a click to join Zoom link uh, rather than a physical location. Um, so what I've done to achieve that is rather than entering a postcode address, I have entered the Zoom webinar link. So if I come back over to events, and I think it's number one. There we go. You can see that I've entered the Zoom uh, location link. Now you can set some liquid up to automate that. So if your client was to put in, um, I don't know, a, a Skype uh, address or maybe a Facebook live link or something like that. Um, you can automatically detect it and switch the buttons out. So you don't necessarily need all of your events to be webinars or all of them to be physical locations. Um, so one of the other areas that we've got linked, so it's built on exactly the same um, structure and database as the e-commerce products we've looked at and this events module is the host. So I've got two hosts available and much like we have with e-commerce products, I can see a list of the hosts there. Now this is actually calling in the authors module. So if I head over to the authors module there, we can see the two items listed. And if you've already got this up and running on a site or a website, um, you will automatically have those authors available to you when you install the events module. And you can come in and edit and add any more information that you'd like to, to form a profile, including various social links uh, and so on. So let's have a quick look. So I'll show you um, a few more of the front end layouts because as I mentioned earlier, we've got the calendar and events um, map as well. So we've, uh, so what I've been looking at over here is the standard events uh, list. So you would use this for, it looks quite familiar if you are used to looking at the blog perhaps or a list of services, that kind of thing. And we have all of the usual filters. So we've got archive in here and you can view past and future events. And you can also run a search to say, if I've got lots of events and I just want to view something in the next two weeks or maybe in the next two months when everyone's out of lockdown, um, you can enter the search filter here and it will collect the list for you. Um, so the, one of the other views, let's look at calendar first. So I'm just going to preview that page and go back a month. So you can see that it's automatically pulling out events that I have set a uh, effectively a due date on. So I'm going to also come back over to the events module. Uh, module events. Okay. okay. So in our events module, we have the release and expiry, which is the same as web apps. Now that will show and hide the actual event item depending on what the date is. But just below that, we have start date and end date. So these are the dates that get pulled through automatically to the, the calendar here. Um, and you can see that there are, you know, there's no And now my internet is dying. Let me know if um, I start. You're back, you're back now, Martin. Right. Excellent, okay. 
so I can yes click into view to view more so I'll go back out now the um, the calendar that we provided here is entirely based on JavaScript and CSS so you have maximum customization over this obviously it doesn't look particularly well styled at the moment it, it kind of works but you might want to tweak it change the colors make it bigger smaller and so on so you have full control over that and I'll come back and show you how to edit that shortly um, so let's go and have a look at the next page view which is the maps view. No, I'm not gonna edit, sorry. There we go. Okay. So I'm using, I haven't entered a, an API key for Google on this site, which is why it's showing development only, but you can see that it's pulling in any events that I've defined a physical location on, rather than a web, uh, web URL, for example. And if I click on one of these, I can see more information about those events. So I'm just gonna head over to this event and I'll show you what that looks like on our side. So if I come into the events module, and it was location three we were looking at. So we've got a new location tab, which you won't see with the web apps or e-commerce. Uh, it's specific to the events module for now. And if I click on this, you can see we've got a search field for finding addresses. This connects with the Google API project key, as you can see. Now, if you enter any legible um, address, postcode, PA box, whatever you'd like, you'll get a list show up. So if I did RG14, something like that, and find new addresses. Yeah, so no addresses found. Let's re-enter this one, shall we? Did you have the API key set up for Google? This so case. this this doesn't actually require. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So the Google Maps Project API key is used for the front end map, but this one runs off of ours, so it does is no nothing needed. It's just because I entered a really vague uh, PO box. So you can see that I've put in address. Now this is very specific, so it's probably only going to come up with a few or one. There you go, because it's a very unique um, address, and I can select that, and it will pre-fill the fields. And I've done that on obviously a couple of the events. So over on our map here, we can see the events that I have uh, done this on. Now, um, you again can customize this. And one of the questions you had last time was um, whether or not you can use another map. So for example, what if you didn't want to use Google Maps? Well, because we are entering the data into JSON in the uh, layout, you can then send that anywhere you would like. So you can call in an external map if you prefer. Um, alrighty, let me check my notes. So, yeah, so that's that's uh, a quick recap of the the events module. I know that some people watching will have seen it, and others wouldn't won't have. So, if you want to find out a bit more, we go into more depth um, on on that events module. Then go and check out our last webinar. Um, so, just one more thing before we dive back into the presentation that I wanted to cover was custom field sets. So um, coming on to the more of the flexibility point uh, again. Um, so down in Site Manager, we can see we have custom field sets here. Let's close that, don't need it. Okay, so I'll make a new one. Uh, let's do set one, there we go. So what we can do here is form groups of fields that we can then add to various areas of admin. So you'll see that you have much of the same field types you would for when you're building out or structuring a web app. Um, so you can make as many, add as many fields as you like, uh, different field types, uh, say they're required, not required, so on. Now, once you set up a field set, you can apply this to currently forms and web apps. Um, along with CRM users. So when we, just as a quick example, so if I was to do a CRM import, because I've got no uh, users in my site yet, I can define which custom field sets I'd like to include in the CSV file for importing data. So if you're migrating from BC and you've got um, uh, different fields um, that, you, that your client is using, you use CRM, you can add those to a custom field set and then formulate a CSV and copy the columns over. 
So you get maximum customization because you can call the fields whatever you'd like and you can use any field type that you'd like um, as well. So you can see the field sets that I've got listed here and then we could export that and so on. Uh, now the same can be said as I mentioned for forms. So if I come back up to here and I'll edit a form. We wouldn't add it to checkout necessarily, but so you can see that there's some default ones in here for the e-commerce because that's what's required. Um, but I can also go and say, okay, well, I want to include a custom field set of my own. Let's just move zoom out the way. There we go. And you can see um, the other custom field set there. Um, so what you can do here is sorry what we can do here is because everything is structured the same way and it's based off of that same core architecture is over time as people need or ask for it we can add it to more areas that we haven't yet done um, so we can add it to modules for example to open up the customization there so um, one of the questions last time was on the events module um, we don't have an image field for maybe a screenshot of uh, a webinar or a picture of the location um, and what we can do is add custom field sets to this module and allow you to come in and there would be a button at the bottom, you click that and then it expands it to, to whatever you need. So that flex, uh, flexibility of the core architecture there is enormous for us to be able to um, open up the platform um, for, for, your, uh, for you and your clients. Alrighty, let's have a quick look. I think I've forgotten something. Let's uh, quickly scroll back up. Doesn't feel certain. No? Okay. Is All right. Uh, editing the layout at all? Or you uh, that. Yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> As I said, I was going to come back to it. <laughs> so, if I. Um, so yes, uh, to edit the event layout, so much like you would for web apps and uh, other modules, when you install the module, um, you can come into Site Manager Code Editor and you'll see here that the events module folder structure is automatically installed on the site for you. Um, just like it would be if you created a new web app or, or, uh, or what have you, or made, made new form, that kind of thing. So inside uh, here, you can see we've got default, which is just gonna be minimal, um, files code wise. So there won't be much in these if I go to detail view. So there's some basic liquid, but there isn't much CSS around that, that kind of thing. Um, so it's simply there to show you the structure of what you would need if you were to customize things. Or you can dive into the design system folder, which is where you'll find these pre-built layouts that we were looking at. So this map view um, and the list view and so on with the right hand side. Now, we've got quite a few folders in here, and that's because what we've done is a little bit like blog, we've um, made it quite granular. So each of the pieces have their own layout file in terms of the right-hand side, each list view, uh, each section in the right-hand side to allow for maximum customization. So it means that you could um, just tweak one or two files and use that in multiple different um, areas of your site if you so chose. So. If I come down to the map, so one of the things that I mentioned earlier and said I'll come back to is this JSON file. So we can see here that we've pre-built one and this is all of the data that gets called out from the events automatically um, into the Google map file over here. So because it's JSON, it does in effect mean that you could switch out the Google Maps, uh, JavaScript and so on and use your own. Um, so you can either write your own or use a different third party one. So you can do whatever you'd like there. Um, so it's fully customizable, but we have, because of partner feedback and so on, picked Google first, because that's the one that most people want. Um, okay, right. Let's head back to the presentation. So, okay, so the next thing I wanted to come on to was the Zafia Public API, um, et cetera. Now, this is just an example of how we're able to add features in on top of what Platform West are doing to really bring things through to the current age. So, this is something that BC didn't have, and it your clients have uh, some customization in your workflows. Um, there's 
it seems that every um, every client has a slightly different use case for how they'd like to manage their data or their website, etc. So this will give you all of those options. So as of a few weeks ago, our public API uh, was um, updated to include some new endpoints, which we'll take a look at in a minute. And we've also had our Zapier app approved by the Zapier team, um, which allows you, as I say, to connect to thousands of third party tools. So we'll quickly head over to, I've gone slightly ahead in where I wanted, but no worries. So we have the public API page over here and we can provide links uh, or you can find it in our documentation. And you can see that we've added um, most recently cases and users. So what this means is that you can do triggers based on when somebody either fills out a form or gets added to your CRM in another way. So you might do an import of a few hundred people because you've met them at an event um, or, or what have you, and they will automatically be triggered if you, if you connect with those. Uh, also on Zapier front, um, you can now search for our app in there and you can see that we've got some suggested apps down here. We're going to be adding a few more and we're going to be adding some pre-built uh, Zaps. So some of the more common ones um, that we've had feedback from with our partners um, to help you get started even quicker. So let me head back here. So then we're going to come on to the more recent releases. So what we've been up to most recently, I'm just having a quick look at time. Or okay, I'll, oh, I'll finish quickly, I promise. So, there we go. So, um, last week's update included um, e commerce products performance improvements, which is huge. Now, you'll remember, as I've been talking about quite a bit earlier in this presentation, because e commerce is built on the same infrastructure that web apps and forms and everything else is, uh, if we can apply it in one place, we can apply it in others. Um, so you'll see little improvements and over the next coming weeks and months and we'll be able to roll those out to other areas as well. So if I quickly come to the video, just as an example, oh, we've gone ahead, replay. So we can see here that I'm doing a test on um, a site that doesn't have the update, um, just our starter site. There you go. And you can see that I've got cash off and there's a time to first buy of just under four seconds. Um, with, I can't remember how many products, maybe 50, 100, something like that. Um, but when we switch to the site that has the newest update and refresh again without cash, we've got a time to first bite of under a second. So there are, there's more than 60% improvement there on page loads, which is excellent. Okay. Okay, so uh, then we come on to this week's release, today's release. So we have admin performance upgrades. So you will notice this more um, when loading into a website that the uh, into your admin, sorry, that the time to load will be reduced unless doing an update. And you'll notice that we have slightly more load time on each individual page. Now that's because what we've done is adjusted it. So rather than when you load the the uh, admin instance first, you get all of the information. We do it in stages now to make that process a bit smoother. So if you don't go into forms, then we won't need to load forms, for example. Uh, there's more we want to do there um, and will do over time, um, but we're just making a start there. Um, we, we, <laughs> we hope to, well, we definitely will make uh, the admin pages blazingly fast, but we wanted to focus on the BC features first. Um, so this is just a sign of things to come. Uh, then we have e-commerce orders in emails. So when somebody submits an order on a website, you're now able to pull that order information through to autoresponders and workflows, which is excellent and quite a popular one from our partners. And then we have automatic site map generation. So you'll now be able to come into your admin and click a button to automatically generate an HTML site map uh, for a website. And if you wanted to, you could circle around and do that again later if for example, the, the site has grown somewhat, or we've been doing a marketing, marketing campaign and that kind of thing. And we also have a new migrations tool area. So I'll dive out. Well, let's see, have we got one more? No, okay. So I'll dive out. So in Site Manager now, we have moved um, the importing tools for web apps, categories, and the blog module that you get from BC Exporter into its own section, which just gives us some flexibility 
visibility to this section later with tying it into web apps specifically. Um, so you can see the normal UI there that you would have seen in web apps is now available here. Um, so just a minor change there, but it's important to separate those for us moving forwards. Um, okay. Let's go back. Okay, so what are we working on next? So these are a few things that work that are coming out in the next week or two, and um, the others are not long after that. So we have web app performance improvements. Let's move zoom out of the way. And web app front end edits. Um, so that's going to be really important for those uh, online portals, um, forums, and what have you. So being able to have um, somebody log into the front end and edit a web app item from there. Um, the media downloads module, so secure media, um, being able to upload that, and this is heavily built on the platform OS architecture as well. So a, a, a file uploaded here will be secure, and if I was to share my link with somebody else, then it wouldn't, wouldn't work. Um, so there's various things there, and we'll talk about more about that in the next few weeks. Um, then we have CRM segments. So this is something we've been working on following the release of our Zapier release. Um, so we're um, changing the way that uh, initially email marketing lists worked to be more generic. So we can have general CRM segments that you can then use to group and push uh, user groups to your third party applications. And finally, courses. So in our documentation, I will quickly go out. We've got our first getting started course in our documentation here, along with some videos that are being revised and improved at the moment uh, based on feedback. Um, but we're also working on a second course for uh, building a small e-commerce site out based on the starter site within a matter of hours, um, which is obviously quite prevalent for, um, for the current times because a lot of businesses can't open their physical premises. So we want to be able to um, help them get online as quickly as possible. And then the third course following the web app edit uh, release, we will have uh, building an online uh, portal area um, with editing of web items and ownership and, and, and so on as well. Uh, so I think that is the end. Let's have a quick look. Yep. All righty. Any questions? I've not been looking at chat. Not so far. Mark uh, has had some DNS related questions on um, GoDaddy and A records needing static IP addresses versus load balances, fully qualified domain name. So mm -hmm. having a, a separate chat there. Um, my only comment was when you said this is the end, it looks to me like it's just the beginning. <laughs> this is amazing. Yeah, it's fantastic to see what you guys have done. It's uh, it's amazing, seriously. And to know and to see how fast and how you're leveraging all of the, the key performance things that we are we're anal about here at Platform OS is fantastic. Um, and we know that the cooperation between the developer team has been amazing. And I think is Matt in the room? Is Matt here? Um, and Dean, I know our engineering team speaks very highly of your guys. So great presentation, Martin. Let's open it up to questions. There's got to be some questions out there. I always get impressed by you guys too. It's like, I just smile and I see what you're continually adding and it's like everything we could hope for in terms of a, a channel partner building complex, making the complexity of what we have easy for a non-technical uh, agency and to be building the, uh, the developer, the developer, the um, digital experience platform that you're building. See, I got that right, right, Luke? <laughs> yeah. Digital <spot> <laughs> experience at the DXP. Uh, it's what it's all about. Online DXP, not websites. Yep. <laughs> there uh, was one question from Bruce. <clears throat> Uh, about the online portal area, Martin. So the third course that we're looking at. Uh, I can, I can jump in if you like. Or <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's sort of early, early days planning there in terms of. So, well, what we're going to be doing is adding it to the existing starter site first of all. So if I 
back up here. Yeah. So everything that I've been showing today, and well, I think we pretty much use this template in all, all of the uh, webinars we do, is um, starter site. So you can come over on any site. Let's go to here. Oh no, we can't, sorry, bear with me. So what you can do is uh, when you create a new website, you can say um, that you want to install design system and you want to install starter site. So what we're doing is as we release a feature, um, probably a little bit behind that, the, um, some of the, the guys in the dev team will add the same functionality with the layouts that come with it. So like the events module in, into that starter site. So when we add um, front end editing for module um, items, um, what we'll do is create a form area in a secure zone uh, on that site and allow you to install that when you create one. So the course will be centered around that and it will be for things like um, we'll probably have a comments section. So maybe if you've got um, like a, an online uh, forum area or perhaps you'll, you want to add comments to uh, products um, and, and things like that. Um, Luke, I don't know if you want to because you've been a little bit more involved with the planning side on that. Have you got anything to add? It, it was touching on your point really about um, helping people do more things online that up until recently happened offline. So really want to to offer a, a course about building courses, <laughs> helping people move things online that, that would otherwise not be. So um, using all the features that you've talked about, pulling them together. So forms, secure zones, CRM, front end web app edit to make online membership, online courses, online forums, as you mentioned, communities, all of, all of that kind of things. But we'd start off with a course. So building a simple um, course using web apps and, and all of those features. Yeah. yeah. Just one thing I wanted to, to mention quickly, uh, unless any more questions come in. Um, we, we've had, uh, sort of back to your point, Adam, we've had um, uh, a lot of feedback over the months and, and years and requests, and we've been working on BC features, but I kind of feel like we're turning, turning a bit of a corner there. We've got those BC features in place. We're starting to look at performance. And I just wanted a quick sort of shout out to our advisory board, which a bit like uh, BC had, we've got um, partners who give us some really great insight and feedback into the product and, and what, what we need to be working on. And the last few months, I think that's really steered us um, in the right direction. And we're now able to look at real sort of scalability and, and, the, and the, next, the next level of things. A good example of that is sort of going from uh, partners that were working on sort of importing five to 10,000 database items, so web items, and we're now looking at expanding, well, we're, we're now expanding that up to sort of 50,000. That's been, been something that's happening recently with partners. So we've had really helpful feedback and insight and also experience of going through those, um, those projects with them. So that's been really helpful. I think my final point on that is, is all of the, the, the point of using the same architecture and having that from Platform OS is, a really holistic view of data bringing data together so that you can access it anywhere use it share it connect up to other systems i think the api and zapier shows that so you can now get data into the system via a form you can output it and work with it in the site using secure zones and web apps and then you could send it out to salesforce google sheets you could even import all your data via google sheets if you wanted to so we really want to make sure that data is the sort of central point and um, as adam mentioned about the digital experience platform that's we believe that's far more than a, um, what people need now not just a cms you need something that really makes a digital experience for, for users and putting data at the core so yeah, thank you once again to, to all the feedback we've had. And, mm. um, yeah. And, and one thing you've just reminded me of that I was, um, I was going to try and get in earlier, but I forgot, was that um, actually while we've been focusing on the database stuff today with the building on, on top of Platform OS, uh, if they introduce um, new uh, technologies that we may not even be aware of yet because they don't exist yet, so in the next five to 10 years, if new technologies come up, Platform OS are going to be putting those into the core functionality, which means that we have uh, those same principles running through them with speed, reliability, and so on. And then we'll be able to offer the same to our partners. Um, it might take us a month or two to, to implement it into our system as well. Um, but anything that they add, you can do from... 
from Cyclide as well. Um, so you're really creating your projects in terms of uh, longe longevity and, uh, and reliance uh, as well. Uh, yeah, we right. try to make sure we cooperate uh, really closely with the Cyclide team for those things. For example, Google Cloud, they were one of the first to be testing uh, the deployment of Cyclide via our intermediate deployment service so that it was just seamless. No, we don't want you to have to rewrite anything except for depre deprecated code, <clears throat> image upload. Uh, no writing of any code in behind the scenes when it comes to deployment. So when we add Azure, Boom, site collides should be able to just, there's the same process. I would like to be on a region in uh, the, the new Poland Azure data center, $1 billion being invented, invested there by Microsoft. So where, wherever you need your sites to be deployed on any infrastructure, uh, site collide will be able to do that off the back of what we've done. So we'll be continuing that cooperation to make it uh, easier for the site collide channel partners to take advantage of seamlessly. And, and just one final example of that, and, and thank you again to um, Adam's team, Macek in particular, for working with us on the site copy feature, um, being able to copy sites. That's that's going to be huge. Uh, I'm sure people are using it on Platform West already. We've got such big plans for that uh, in terms of being able to create modular elements, um, turnkey sites for verticals and niche markets. It's, it's, it's been a big undertaking for the Platform West team, but working very closely, we've come up with something, well, they've come up with something and helped us um, open up a whole, whole world of opportunity there. So thank you. <laughs> Oh, that's great. Uh, I mean, look, we, I get really excited. I, I look at a message from a channel partner who has a request, look, we need to do an import of hundreds of thousands of records, or we need to do this thing with lots and lots of data. How long will it take? And the check will go, oh, well, the new import export feature, uh, we'll do it in a few seconds. And eyes light up and they go, oh, I thought it would take hours. I go, no, no, a few seconds. Oh, you, okay. And they go and do it and they come back. Yes, it was a few seconds. Now, they're the things that we get really excited about here at Platform OS. Let's not lose sight of what Cyclide does because at the end of the day, it's how quickly, not I can import data, but how quickly can I build a solution for a business person who needs a practical website or an application that helps my business. Importing, infrastructure, database, all that stuff should work seamlessly really fast. Cyclide investment is on making the user experience you know user first the design system principles that they're embedding in site glide uh, makes it easy for an agency then to sell to the end customer the business owner because they don't care at the end of the day about all these fancy words that you and me and this group talk about what they care about is having their problem solved and it's awesome to see the, the problems that the site glide team are so solving all the time so we're we're really impressed great to hear <laughs> mutual you. mutual admiration society yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i've seen one more question coming actually from from mark it's um quite an interesting one uh what's the what's a comfortable maximum number of products or web app items Millions. so this is there you go. <laughs> this is a great example actually because on it starts on the platform west side so I don't know what your answer is there. Is it really millions? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Like, uh, honestly, so what happened with, with BC's architecture, there was sort of some, there were limits to the number of things that you could have because eventually the, it would just get slower and slower and slower with the more data you put in. Uh, so the way we've built Platform OS is to have it so that, yes, you can have millions and we use different solutions for, for example, full text indexing using Elasticsearch has been designed for millions of uh, rows of data that can be searched very fast and they, you can do aggregations and nesting of data through Elasticsearch. So at that level, um, and also using Postgres as a database, it can handle billions and billions of rows, literally billions of rows of data in all of its tables and millions of, of different models. Um, so you can do it that way and then 
when you get an enterprise grade client, you know, we've got Intel using Platform OS and Hallmark and some large multinational companies, and they have very specific load requirements. So you get to a point where, okay, I need some dedicated servers allocated to this, not a problem. Whereas BC, you couldn't do that. It was all multi-tenanted. You couldn't have a single tenanted client with billions of rows of data that could be accommodated on Platform OS. We've architected it del deliberately to allow for that. So start small, grow and take over Amazon. Using Amazon Web Services, if you want, or <laughs> Google Cloud. Yeah, then we, so we know that the limitations on your side are, are, are huge, if there are any, if you call them limitations. Um, so then on our side, we've got to provide you the admin, the interface to, to work with that data. And we're going to do that to the level that's required. So in the first year, people were uploading, say, 5,000, 10,000 items. And we, we worked with that and we made it work really well with that. But then as people start doing 15, 20,000, maybe it was a little bit slower and we've had to had to look at improvements. So uh, Devon's put in the chat that they have a site with 18,000 CRM users and another with 5,000 plus web app items. So that was, obviously it was working at, to that point, but we've been working with a partner in the last, um, last few weeks and months uh, that's more like 50,000 and the the wires charity site with uh, because of all the fires in Australia um, last year they, they've been getting a lot more donations BC was struggling to handle it and that now has over 50,000 I believe so it, it's all about scaling up as demand is there and as customers need it so we'll we'll keep uh oh rich has said two hundred thousand uh on the wires site so um yeah thanks <laughs> thanks rich so yeah the guys that are um one orange cow have been been building that on top and and knowing that they can they, they have the scalability of platform OS behind it so yeah we'll put in a caveat just just for because somebody will go well hang on i've only got eighty thousand records and it's really slow because we expose the ability to access and create your own graph queries as well if you're constructing graph queries in these, say, one API endpoint with a graph query that has all sorts of if-then statements and it goes off and grabs other nested things and like any database, bad architecture and design will impact performance. We continually monitor that as well. So we're accounting for some of the worst edge case, badly designed queries and still doing high quality uh, results. But at a certain point, you have to also design your system well, and that's what Cyclide are doing. They're continually taking advantage of, of good design principles. And I know with uh, the direct connection with our team that they're making sure that all the queries that they're writing in the background are as optimized as possible. So yeah, you should be able to handle millions of rows. Yeah, and, and then it's the same with us, really. So, yeah, there, there might be. Um, just work with us on it. And um, uh, so to answer your question, Mark, uh, we're, we're getting to that sort of 50,000 uh, kind of mark at the moment, but I think it's important to sort of work with us and um, uh, give us any feedback if, if you're having any issues. But, uh, yeah, we can, we can keep scaling it up uh, and, and handle, handle even more. Um, also, there was a question from Bruce about image thumbnailing, resizing like BC. Uh, the Direct Test 3, I think we've got example code that Pavel put together uh, for that. So, Dean, are you in the room? Have you been working with Pavel on the Direct Test 3 image upload, thumbnailing, all the functionality that the, that provides? Yeah, um, as far as I'm aware, it's not on S3 yet, I don't think, although... If it is, let me know and because I want it. <laughs> okay, let me go to example dot. It's in custom images, I think, but it's not on the assets. Oh, okay. Custom, and custom images, of course, are being deprecated shortly to also get rid of all of those size limitations. If you want five, what is it, 50 gig or five gig? Five gig per file? Upload? Yeah, five gig per file, mod parts, five terabyte. That's right. Five terabytes here, yeah, multi-part files, five terabyte upload if you need to 
have a client mm-hmm. do that. So I'll have to I'll have to jump in uh, with Pavel, and he's the ex- resident expert on image uploads and and the like. But definitely with the direct S3 upload feature that we've got now, and doing image optimization and creating multiple versions of images and different things. Yeah, that's uh, if it's not there, it isn't far off. Um, what other questions just, have we missed? Just jumping back to the data sets and size limits um, uh, point, uh, Devon's rightly pointed out, it's a great example actually. We, we work on things in different stages. So there's being able to store 100,000 items and being able to access them and import them and they're all different things. So um, yeah, there are sites with more items in there than we realized. Uh, We've been working on say 50,000, but as Devin said, the import function um, still needs some work to sort of um, get up to that stage. So it's all about um, the demand really. If if we know, um, if we know there's a new bar to aim at, we we will (laughs) and and we'll make sure it's all all possible. So um, we're we're aiming at 50,000 because that's site that we know that we're working with but there's no reason the solution that we're working on won't go way beyond that it's just we need to keep testing it and so matt that is in relation to the new pos cli import update that machek and the team released yeah exactly and also um outputting that data in our ui Mm -hmm. great yep lots of cooperation going on there so devon we love the throwdown challenge (laughs) Great case study, by the way, mate, on your uh, on your site that you built. Yeah, if, if people haven't seen that, it's um, well worth having a watch. And thank you again, Devon, for putting quite a bit of time into explaining how to do a, a fairly big and complex migration. That's a blog post on our website if, if nobody's seen it. Brilliant. Well, just over top of the hour, any final thoughts, questions, feedback for the team at SiteGlide? Great job again, Martin. Luke, thanks for uh, the executive oversight. Just chipping at the end. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, we will leave it at there. We'll have the video up in the next 48 hours, I believe. I've just got to get a little bit more sun before this. This sun just never sets here. It's always sunny in my room. Uh, Look forward to seeing you at Town Hall 82 next week. And for those watching the video, thank you very much. Thumbs up, like, subscribe, all of that. Got to get used to this YouTube uh, thing. And we will see you in Slack if that's where you're hanging out. We'll see you on email and we'll see you at the next Town Hall. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now.